Okay, this is Laura Owen interviewing for Passing the Flame. Um, could you say your name for the recording, please? Yeah, my name's Robbie Barrett. And where were you born? Belfast, Northern Ireland. Okay. Um, yeah, what was that like growing up? Uh, it, was, it was... I had a great childhood. Um, um, but um, the problem was that um, as we moved, as I progressed at an age, so did the troubles in Northern Ireland. And so I was there for a lot of that. And, uh, there was so much sectarianism going on. Um, and um, I didn't want to remain as part of anything that was going on there. And because it had a tendency to draw everybody in. Um, whether you were a schoolboy or not, you were involved in some way or another. You either knew someone or helped someone or everybody was aware of what went on with the UDF, the IRA, the UVF, all those, all those factions. So I, I decided to get out of it. So as I finished my O-levels, I joined the Royal Navy. And um, that was the start of uh, my naval career. Um, and that only finished after about seven years when I lost my leg um, in a place called Iloilo, which is in the Philippines. So um, that put paid to... And the reason why it put paid... It wouldn't happen now, actually, because there are serving soldiers who are double above knee amputees now, uh, and, and sailors who have got arms and legs missing. Um, it was because they didn't... Because the technology was not there to enable you to move around a ship, for example, as freely as you would if you were able-bodied. And so you could only go on board a ship that had a resident doctor on it. And that, that meant you either spent all your life on the Ark Royal or something like that, if you were lucky or not, or you spent all your life on a shore base. And if you don't, don't join the Navy to be on a shore base. Join the Navy to you know travel the world. Um, so they gave me a choice, stay in, naval base, or leave. So I decided I'm going to leave. And um, uh, I actually missed it so much that I wanted to get back into it again, so I, I went to Greenwich uh, Maritime College and did an HNC in um, Maritime Communications General Certificate, MCGC. Anyway, um, which gives you... Uh, it gives you the ability to go on board a merchant naval ship as a radio officer, basically. So you're trained in how to fix the radio. It's more than how to use them, actually. Um, you still have to be able to uh, type at 125 words a minute and um, be able to read Morse code at 22 minutes a minute. So, um, But I had all that already from the Royal Navy, So, because I was a radio operator in the Royal Navy. So all I did was... Um, all I had to concentrate on was the engineering side of it and not you know, having to do all that so that gave me a big advantage over the rest of the class I settled down in a place called Sittingbourne in Kent um, and then moved to Herne Bay um, and then moved to London so but I was commuting actually uh, all the time um, because um, back in the day there wasn't anything uh, there weren't any computers and stuff like that right? so um, the only thing that I was capable of doing, because I could read what they call bid codes, um, which are the telex, um, when telex was round, there used to be this little tape, five, five little dots in it, um, that you could, you could read. So you knew where it started, you knew where it finished, and it was the only form of communication between banks, etc., in London at the time. Um, so uh, I was straight into that as a contractor. Um, because it was the simplest thing to do and worked for a company called Three T's in London um, and then when I went to work for Morgan Stanley which was the first bank I ever went to um, I moved from Telex into um, into the more technical side of everything so uh, mainframe then computers when they first came in desktops and just moved forward as it, as a group basically It was horrifying, really, because um, the 
what happens now is that if you have um, an appendage, let's say, <laughs> amputated, uh, then um, they give you uh, they give you springboards which are really unbelievable. They are they're, they're very um, very technical, really great legs. But at the time I uh, lost my leg, they gave me a socket with two little um, steel rods either side of it, big gap in the middle so you could see right through it, and a wooden club for a foot, just beveled. And that was it. So it kind of tears you apart if you, you, because you think, well, is this all I've got to look forward to? Is this the way I'm going to be for the rest of my life? This is a nightmare. There must be something, you know, must be something better than this. So you feel angry and disappointed that you've been just thrown out into the wild world and that the technology, there's nothing there for you and this is what you're going to have to put up with, you think, for the rest of your life. You know? But so it was, it was I was angry uh, a lot. Why me kind of thing, you know. So, yeah, I wasn't happy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> kind of any support network uh, either through maybe the Navy or through like, no. family or friends or anything? No, there was no support network. I mean, family obviously yeah. rallied around, as they always do, but um, uh, as far as a support network, no, it didn't exist. Um, the British Limbless ex Servicemen's Association, um, I'd never heard of them. There was no nothing. Uh, Balassa, British amputee, you know, uh, and Les Ots Association um, didn't exist as far as I know then. So there was nothing, there was nothing to, to, there was nobody to talk to about it unless you met someone in the limb center um, who was young and into sport, but usually most of the people I met in the limb center were, you know, in the, well, my age now, you know, and they weren't really into sport, maybe fishing, that would be about it, <laughs> you know. So there was nobody young enough and really into any form of sport at all. So there wasn't anybody really to lend much support at all, you know. Um, so that was a difficult period, really. Yeah. yeah. Until I got my first leg. Then it improved, but, you know, not massively, because I kept breaking it all the time. So. What was that like? Well, the, f the first leg wasn't too bad. Um, but by then, um, I had seen on uh, national TV something from, I think it was uh, 1984, which was a pile of poo. And it was the first, it was a, like a kind of documentary um, with really a condescending um, producers and everything else on it, commentators. It was absolutely pathetic. But what it did highlight for the first time that I had never seen on television before, and I don't think I had been on television before, was the fact that um, there was such a thing as the Paralympic Games, uh, and there were athletes, you know, from around the world, all going to one place and competing in the same way that Olympians were, and I, I hadn't realised this even for a moment before then. So that was a real shock to me, and that's what started me on on into being really getting into sports, um, because I had been looking for an avenue. Um, for for years to break into, I thought, well, must be something I can do. I can just walk around, go to the gym, be a fat boy, whatever. It must be something I can really do. But every time I tried to do something like jog or you know uh, any other kind of sport, my leg would just break, it would snap at the ankle because it wasn't meant to do any other things. I was trying to put it through, so it was really frustrating. Um, and the only thing that changed that, well, the big change for that and the whole thing was obviously the invention of the flex foot. And that came about completely by accident, as most of these kind of really marvellous inventions do. Because the guy who invented it um, was working for NASA, and he was working on carbon fibre light materials and their flexibility and all of that. And he was involved in an accident, a car accident, lost his leg, they gave him the same crappy leg they gave everybody, and he kept breaking us as well. And, and he said, "I can make a better. I can make a better leg. I can make a better leg than this." 
And so he did. He, he started making um, what's now commonly known as flex feet. Uh, because he was, a, he was a big tennis um, player at the time. Loved tennis. And he thought, well, I, I, I can't play tennis in this. So that's how the, the flex foot actually came about. And he started then um, promoting it to uh, fitters in the U.S. Um, they saw the potential in it. Um, there were lots of trials. Um, and it evolved until it was good enough um, to be um, sent out worldwide, globally, uh, for trials in UK, Europe, wherever. Um, and, of course, my fitter was sick of seeing me every other day um, to fix the legs that we're having. And we tried to you know, make it stronger and better, but it just wasn't working. So he had heard about this um, Flexfoot and said, would you like to try it? You know, it's the first, uh, and it's um, it's not even on the books yet. The books is a reference to um, all of the legs that you can you can get through the NHS. Um, it refers to once it's in the book, it, that means it's been trialled, it's functional, it does everything that they wanted to do, and they can now, if someone wants it, then they can they can give give that leg to them. Um, and so he said, you, you know, you'd be uh, it'd be great to. If you tried, tried it out. So I, I tried it, and that was the beginning. Once I tried it, they could not, um, uh, they could not refuse me any upgrade to it because I tried it, tested it. They put it on the books, manins uh, on that leg. So every time I broke it, they had to give me a new one. So which happened usually um, maybe two, three times a year uh, to begin with. Um, the worst, uh, the worst times were always you'd be on the track and you'd be at full stretch, um, <laughs> doing three hundred splits or something like that. Your coach yelling at you, and it would snap. There would be no, there would be no, um, you know, uh, kind of warning of any kind. You didn't hear a crack or anything like that. It would just go crack, snap, bang, and you were on your face. So, the <laughs> um, funniest thing was that in, in um, if I go quickly to Seoul for a second, um, when we were in Seoul, um, the same thing happened. Luckily, I had a spare. Um, and um, it, uh, it didn't snap. Um, the leg itself didn't snap. But the, the, the fitting for it, the actual strapping around it, snapped, and it had the same effect. I went straight on my face, huge friction burn down the side of my face, and um, they have this, uh, they have this um, rice wine, which is basically pochine, it's lethal. Um, and uh, every time I would get into talking to locals, they would look at it and go, mm, soju. you. And I would say, no, <laughs> no, <laughs> heaven forbid, no. <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, yeah, so. okay. um, sorry. That's all right, that's good to me. Um, so, had you always been into sport, um, maybe like as a child? Or yeah, I mean, I've always, I've always, but it's always been rugby. Okay. Um, and pole vault actually was a side thing that, I didn't really want to do for very long, mm -hmm. but uh, um, yeah, it's always been rugby. I played scrum half for the Navy, played scrum half for Hong Kong, um, Hong Kong teams, and even when I lost my leg, um, one of the first things I started to do was play rugby again. When I, once I got the flex foot, um, I started playing rugby again with able-bodied teams, um, which was great. Um, nobody, nobody was concerned about it at all. Um, there was only once in I, I was playing for three teams: all Wokutians, Morgan Stanley, and Murabank. Um, and the only once it was picked up by a referee who spotted, and he thought there's something not quite right here. So he came across and um, he, he wanted to check. He said he wanted to check my spikes in my in my boots, 
So he knew that um, the restrictive movement was because there was something wrong with my leg. So he said, have you got an artificial leg? And I said, yes. He said, okay, so um, I'm going to have to go and ask the other team if they mind you playing. So I thought, that's, that's first. No one's, in years I've been playing, no one's ever said that before. So I went across and asked them, and they said, no, oh, no, no problem. Because um, I was playing scrum out, and they thought, this is going to be easy, this. <laughs> <laughs> It wasn't until I was kicking the crap out of their scrum half that um, they maybe changed their mind <laughs> about that. So, yeah, that was good. It was, it was the, but it was the first time. Usually what would have happened would be they wouldn't know until um, they'd see me in the shower and go, oh, my God, and the face is just it's like a shock, a real, real big shock that they'd been playing with this guy and, you know, hadn't realised that he had a leg missing. It's just crazy. Who does that? You know, so... Yeah, so I've always been into sport, um, and the rugby was was always a great social, uh, you know, a great social aspect of it. Always has been, um, and uh, it wasn't until I, I say I got drawn into more into the athletic side of things that um, I kind of gave up the rugby side because too many injuries. Yeah. yeah, but I'd like to even now, if if I was going to play a sport, I mean, I'd go back to playing rugby. Um, I think there is well you know <laughs> you've seen the um, last leg on TV yes. where one of the presenters <laughs> plays rugby but it's touch rugby you know yeah if you can catch me <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so I, I, I wouldn't mind giving that a go I mm. probably wouldn't be as much fun as <laughs> um, mainstream rugby but <laughs> Um, so did you get into para, uh, sorry, into athletics after you lost your leg, or did you ever do it before? Um, yeah, athletics. Um, the only time I did athletics was during Navy sports days. Um, rest of the time it was just pure pure rugby, and um, yeah, I was pretty good at it. So I played stand up for for the Navy um, at one point, and um, yeah, I loved it. It was great. Especially the social aspect of that was crazy. So, yeah. Okay. Um, so can you just talk a bit through maybe like your journey getting into athletics? Um, yeah, yeah. Life? Well, uh, athletics. I mean, um, it wasn't until I, I actually got to the Flexford uh, and thought, well, now you can actually you can run. Um, so I thought, well. Um, but how am I, who am I going to run against? And then I heard about uh, uh, Balassa and British Amputee Les Autres Association. So I decided to go along to one of their uh, regional kind of um, meetings and just try out, basically, see how quick I was over 100 or, you know, and try some of the other sports like discus and shot. No training of any kind, really. Um, so I did, and, and I, I really enjoyed it. Really enjoyed meeting other amputees, etc. Um, uh, and there's lots, you know, so many other disabilities. Uh, that was the first time I'd ever got together with so many different factions of disabilities uh, coming together as athletes. Some of them trained, some of them there just to try, uh, like me, at the time. Uh, and I did really well, so I was invited along to um, one of the na- to the national games. Um, because my times were good enough, my distances were good enough. So I went along to the National Games, and that's when I really started to get into it, after the National Games. It what kind of... Ooh. Um, no that's a idea. Bit of time. <laughs> that's a bit of a time frame. I have no idea. I just need to prefer. It must have been... Um, must have been in mid-80s, something like that. Yeah. Certainly, certainly about three years, probably before um, I sold in 88. Um, so it took me quite a while to progress to where I thought I could go to Seoul, and they thought I could go to Seoul. I say they, by the Olympic Committee, Paralympic Committee, uh, thought I could go to Seoul and take a medal because they weren't, they wouldn't send anyone who wasn't, they didn't think was going to medal. And it's the same now; they really don't take anyone who they don't think stands a really good chance of being a medal winner to any games like that whether it's European worlds or 
um, you know, the Paralympic. So, yeah, so um, that's how I got involved in it more. And what I did was, instead of um, instead of just waiting for regionals and training on your own, um, I decided to join the local um, sports club um, where there was some, luckily for me, there were some really good athletes who were um, either regional or national um, athletes. Same with Crystal Palace. When I moved into London, I went to Crystal Palace and trained with um, athletes. And you would always run into national champions and things like that. And they were quite happy to sit down and, or have a look at your technique and give you pointers and things like that. Um, and it was the same with the, the, you know, all of the guys in my club, in my local athletics club. Um, I would go with them uh, to weekend meetings and I would run in 100 and 400. Um, and um, I remember running a, a 200 meter sprint uh, amongst uh, this group of able body guys and I beat uh, everybody except one, so I was runner up. And um, I remember the guy saying to me, he said, he said, um, he said that was so that was a good race. Um, he said, but what's wrong with your leg? <laughs> I said, well, I haven't got one. It's just an artificial leg. So he just didn't know what to say after that. <laughs> He'd just been beaten by a guy with one leg missing. But <laughs> It doesn't sit well with athletes <laughs> usually, um, and it was it, obviously it was unusual because um, there wasn't many athletes who were doing the same thing with mainstream athletes, um, able, disabled athletes. Uh, but I think now it's more acceptable, and because of you know because obviously because of 2012 and all of um, the promotional work that went around that, and people filling those stadiums and seeing athletes in a completely different perspective and light um, it's quite acceptable for you know a disabled athlete to go to and join uh, an able body club whether it's a rugby club whether it's an athletics club a swimming club any of those things and, c- and compete and train with those athletes you know? uh, and that's changed that's changed that's changed everything really you can see when you look at how fit and how controlled and uh, focused all of the athletes on who go to Paralympic Games now that it, that mindset and everything else has changed not just for the athletes but for the people who work with them uh, and people who are their friends and you know other athletes who they, they train with locally and socially it's all changed their whole perspective has changed you know. um, did you ever face any sort of prejudice or anything else that kind of sticks out to you? no only from only from other athletes who used to pick on me quite a lot, um, especially the Thalidomide athletes. You know, I'd go to the loo and I'd hear some giggling in the in the, um, in the cubicle next to me, and then suddenly a bucket of water would come over the top. And uh, these guys, these are guys who've got no arms. Um, or like Frank had arms, had just little hands, really, very short. And Peter didn't have any arms at all. His, it's it's just like somebody forgot to put the arms on, so it's only to the shoulders, and yet the two of them would manage, one to get on the other shoulder and toss a bucket of water over me while I was sitting on the loo. It was <laughs> unbelievable. Some of the stunts those boys got up to. But, um, yeah, so I'd get, I'd get my arm back on them by doing just equally as stupid things. Um, so I'd wait till they were putting their sports bag in the boot, and as I leaned over to put it in, I'd push them into the boot and shut it. <laughs> and just leave them in there. <laughs> and they would have to kick kick the back seat down to get out. Wow. Were they doing that like maliciously to you? Yeah, no, no, no. Not much. Like, no. no it's all a joke. Okay. It's all a joke. It's all in good fun. Um, maliciously, I've never seen any, um, any aggressive behaviour to any uh, disabled athlete from another disabled athlete. There's all the usual bitching and things like that that goes on in any sport, um, you know, between athletes, uh, moans and groans and the usual stuff, but nothing really malicious. Um, the only time I have seen anything that's even close to that is in snowboarding. Uh, when I was at the, when I competed in the World Championships um, in Ossia, and um, it was the Americans and the Canadians. 
they were seriously bitter because um, the Europeans, they, this was the first time that they really um, had got some great snowboarders from Europe um, into the World Championships. And they were killing the Americans and, and the Canadians, who up until then were superheroes of the whole sport. Nobody, they thought, could beat them. And, um, and these guys were just wiping the floor with them. They made them look stupid. Um, and uh, some of the comments were seriously malicious <laughs> from those guys. But that's the only time I've ever seen anything like that before. Yeah. Did you ever have anything from maybe outside of the Paralympic community? Any prejudice? Huh? No. No, I've never, never I've had that. It might be because, um, you know, unless I'm wearing shorts, no, one, no one's uh, going to notice the leg. And even when I'm wearing shorts, because, because I've, I trained for so many years as an athlete, especially as sprinters, and you will see this if you look at most sprinters, um, the gait is so good when they walk, you can't tell that they have a, a leg missing at all. And I practice my gait a lot. Um, so I walk quite normally, you can't tell. And so even with shorts on, because you walk so well, even if you, you know, you're walking in front of someone, I don't, I don't realize that there is, um, you know, that you have a disability. So uh, I've never, f never had that problem really. Can I throw one in there? So um, you said that you did a race with able-bodied um, runners as well. Mm. Did they, um, they think that your flex foot mm. was um, an advantage? No, come up with not at the time. No, they'd never, never seen anything like it before. No, so, no. Um, it so wasn't. You had more spring in your step for anything. Yeah, no, they didn't know anything about it. They just, you know, they just saw it as a piece of metal. Really, um, they didn't realize what <coughs> how technically involved, you know, that leg was. Mm. Um, but I, I, I can see what you mean. Um, it has, I have heard a lot of people discussing the fact that it's a, it's a major advantage mm. and that it will become even more of a major advantage mm. as the technology moves on. Mm. We hear this all the time with amputees, mm. you know, whether it's arms or legs, mm -hmm. um, because the technology is moving so fast with them mm -hmm. uh, and they are so light and such great, um, greatly engineered legs mm -hmm. <coughs> that there are, you know, I think... I don't know. I, have, I don't know. I haven't spoken to any of the um, sprinters who actually formally take part in any able-bodied regional meetings and things yeah. like that. I know there was a big thing with the South Pretorius. African, Pretorius, yeah. and he wanted to get into the games and probably could have one, qualified. Didn't he? didn't he do one with... Uh, he did one in the same... He did the Paralympics, <coughs> he did the Paralympics, didn't he? One yeah. 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 And there was some talk there, I think. Yeah. Yeah, see, I mean, and it is, uh, I mean, um, over distances especially, the um, double amputee yeah. wearing flex, yeah. you can see the difference. Yeah. You know, over 400 meters, I mean, um, look at Richard Whitehead, shift over 400 meters. I mean, that is, that is just phenomenal. Mm -hmm. His his gait mm -hmm. and his leg mm -hmm. reach mm -hmm, mm -hmm. is enormous. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm it doesn't look that fast when you watch him on telly, but like any race, it doesn't look that fast. No. But if you're watching this guy in, you know, in a stadium, yeah. you just think, oh my God, I've never yeah. seen anybody move that fast before. Yes. And it's the same when you're watching able body guys you know, in 100 meters. Mm -hmm. Looks like, I mean, come on, 9.7 mm -hmm. from there to there? Mm -hmm. Are you kidding me? Mm -hmm. Couldn't get a cheetah to do that. Yeah. It's just so fast. But it, 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 unless you're there, and you're watching it physically, mm -hmm. you have no idea of, the, of how fast they're actually moving. It's incredible. Mm -hmm. That's why, you know, don't watch it on telly. Go and see it, you know. Whether it's Paralympic or Olympic, just go and see it. So with all the um, sort of accidents, incidents, you know, when you said it was breaking, that kind of thing, did that not ever put you off? <coughs> no. That was part of uh, the, um, part of what you had to suck up because they were so new. And you knew you were still, they were still being trialed and they were getting improved. And every time you, you did something and it broke it, they would investigate why it was delaminating mm -hmm. and how they could you know, prevent that, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. And um, 
yeah I mean obviously there were a few, a few number of times when it when it happened and, and really when you're when you're at full pelt or something mm-hmm. like that but you could it became something that you listened to mm-hmm. and it became something that you inspected like guys you know like guys will inspect their spikes to make sure that you know the spikes are all secured mm-hmm. laces are well tied you yes. know that kind of thing mm-hmm. um, and yeah, you know, whatever tool you're using, and it is really a tool. You think of it as a tool, mm-hmm. really uh, a blade when you're running on it. So you need to you need to check it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, you need to check the wear and tear on it. You need to check that it's you can't see any form of cracking or mm-hmm. delaminating mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. things like that, um, because that's the last thing you would want. Do you have uh, any rituals? Sorry. Do you have any rituals? Apart from checking your Apart from checking... Oh, rituals. Um, <laughs> no. Lucky, um, lucky. Yeah, I mean, um, you do get into a, a kind of a zone with it where you ignore everything else around you and <coughs> you simply focus on, on the race and psychologically you just focus on getting down and you just see yourself doing the whole thing. Mm-hmm. It's progressional. Mm-hmm. Uh, and obviously you see yourself winning. might not always happen, but, you know, <laughs> it's a positive motivator, yeah. you know, so... Um, and that has that I find that over the years, um, uh, because I, I kind of stayed in sport when I moved into um, when I moved into sitting volleyball, mm-hmm. the psychology for um, the teams, uh, certainly in sitting volleyball, um, there is a permanent psychologist that's with the group all of the time, and they will they will they will steer you in you know the directions that you need to go in. Uh, and it's very one-on-one as well. There, is, there are obviously team things that they want you to do together, but they will give you a one-to-one focus as well. Right. And say these are the things that you need to work on. Mm-hmm. You know, um, so it, it's changed enormously. There wasn't that kind of thing around when we were doing it. Um, I was just lucky enough to have a coach who was um, uh, a university lecturer on sport, and it was one of the things he, he was. Um, he was lecturing on so this new form of, of um, getting into the zone and focusing your mind on what you were doing uh, and that making a difference to everything that happened mm. when that gun went yeah so that was fortunate good coaches mm. what sort of things uh, did he teach you in that or did he talk about getting into the right hand space yeah I mean it depends on it depends on the individual, but in the same way that you know you listen to maybe heavy music when you're in the gym because you want to you know want to get into that kind of zone where you're punching weights and stuff like that. Same, it's it's an individual taste on what kind of music you want. It's focusing your mind on you know getting that wound up and primed, etc., and just getting away from everyone else. You know, blinkering everything except. Um, you know, hearing the gun, getting off the blocks, positioning, all of those things. Um, and you see yourself, you know, moving into transitions and then into uh, a full sprint and you know, pushing through the line, etc., etc. And, and you don't see anything around you at all. And in the race, that's you don't see anything. You know, you're aware that there are people close to you, but as soon as you start thinking, he's going to catch me, then you start to tense, and that's it, you're dead. You know, it's all going to go to south from there on in, <laughs> especially over a longer distance, yeah. two or four. Mm. Too late. Did you ever have a song that got you in there? What, a particular one? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I what just... Like music? Oh, heavy rock, usually. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Funny the way that is. <laughs> 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 Um, yeah, so how did you go on from having your local club? How did you then get into the Paralympics? Um, from the local club, I mean, like I say, I went to went to uh, the Balassa thing, uh, where they had regional meetings, qualified for the nationals, went to the nationals, they saw potential. So then uh, they had their own national training weekends. So you know, I would go to more of the national training weekends. There weren't as many as there are now for national teams and squads especially leading up to games. Um, it was quite intermittent. Um, but I went to those, and there was a national coach for the athletic side, John de Corsi. 
who was uh, uh, Edinburgh University, and uh, he was he was uh, doing all of the all of the track uh, track guys. He was so he was taking care of all of us, coaching all the track guys, and um, he convinced the because um, initially the in '88 they weren't going to send me to the games in '88. They didn't think that I was fast enough um, to compete against Dennis Oler, who was the number one in the world American. And um, an Australian, um, and a few others who were really fast at the time. So they sent me to um, sent me to Canada, to uh, Ontario, and uh, I competed there. It was it was at the um, when the Canadians were trialing. Everyone was trialing for the '88 Games in, in Canada, and when Ben Johnson was there and he was in front of me and was, he was in front of me and I, I watched that race and boy could that guy move um, but the worst of it was was the cal- television crews were there everywhere and we were treated like athletes by all of the staff etc but um, when I watched back the, the replays of all of the, the what, what appeared on, on Canadian television there was nothing the race wasn't even there you could see us warming up in the background because obviously with Johnson and the race before you, you know, all, all the camera focus was down that end of the track. So you could see us all warming up in the background, etc. But as to the race, zip, nothing. Nothing at all. Which was, I thought was pathetic, really pathetic at the time. Because what would it have taken? A minute to, of their time to record the race and show a different perspective on on athletics completely they had a great opportunity and for some reason I don't know what prejudice whatever wasn't popular enough nobody wanted to see it you know I don't know what do you think about mixing the two areas of sport then do you think they should like Paralympics and Olympics be no. mixed or should no. be separate no totally separate no that would destroy the Paralympics and what everything it stands for and I feel the same way about Paralympians going to compete in, a, in the Olympic side of things. Why? You know, um, that's just it would destroy it. I think you know, I, I'm totally against the idea. If you want to do it up to you know international level or something like that, but when it comes to Olympics and Paralympics, they need to be separate. Otherwise, how you, otherwise, all you're going to do is put people who can achieve something that's close to an able-bodied time or distance or whatever into that group. And it's going to become less and less of those people. So if you mix the two, you're going to see less stable sports people um, competing. What about them ha- happening at the same time? So you said your race was after Ben Johnson. Yeah. Do you think that would be a good idea? That, that would be a good idea. So that Olympic Paralympics was actually just yeah. one event. Yeah. I mean, uh, the, the, again, the problem with that is going to be media. The media are going to say, right, okay, so if we're going to do the two together, we're going to have to shrink it. You can't have one going on for four weeks and another one going on for four weeks. You know, two months of everybody's going to get bored or whatever. Um, they're going to come up with something. And they'll say, we need to shrink this down. So again, you're going to see less um, categories, maybe, uh, and less less sports coming to the fore, even new sports coming to the fore. You know, like uh, um, like we've just seen, uh, you know, uh, with the Winter Olympics, for the first time, really, um, snowboarding, which is fantastic. And I, when I was in Osseo, the thing that blew my mind most um, about doing the slaloms um, because they're they're really fast bends into big big jumps and they may not look on on TV but they're scary and um, the guys that the guys that blew my mind were the blind guys who were doing it blind guy on a snowboard doing that that's just that was just I just thought well, man, you don't have a disability this is like just a flesh wound of some kind <laughs> compared to these guys who are, who are so good at this and they had Okay, so they had a, a, a guide in front calling out instructions, but you don't see any of what he's telling you. Mm. You just got to trust him. Mm. 
and trust your ability. I mean, I don't even know how you get to that stage. No, no. You know, how do you even, how do you practice that? <laughs> it's just mental. Could you talk us through your your first games, your kind of history of, of participating? Yeah, I was going to ask, sorry. Yes. No, no. How did you get from, you said you weren't, uh, they weren't going to send you. Because when I went to when I went to the games in Ontario, the pre selector for eighty uh, eight with uh, Ben Johnson, etc., um, they saw the times from that. Uh, I was second in that race, uh, and Oler, who was the fastest man in the world at the time, was only a couple of tenths of a second in front of me. So my coach just went the times. You're telling me that he isn't going to medal in 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 Seoul with these times. You're crazy. You know he's only just been beaten by the fastest guy in the world. You know it's just stupid not to send him. So you know, he had a big argument with the Paralympic committee. In the end, they said, "Oh, all right, you can go." <laughs> How old were you at that point? Now you're asking. Sorry. <laughs> I think. <laughs> I think it was uh, the late twenties at the time. I think, yeah, it took me a long time to get to. I, mean, I think when I went to Barcelona, I was thirty-two or something like that. Yeah, going on to after, what was your first games like? Oh, the first games were uh, mind-blowing, really, uh, in '88. But again, it was um, the opening because the opening ceremony was was fabulous. It was fantastic. Um, we were right in the middle of the stadium during the opening ceremony. So we could see everything that was going on in it. Was, it was stunning. It was, you know, a sensational. And we could see all the camera crews around, and it was all being filmed. Yet nothing came up on British television. There was nothing on British media at all. So when I got home and said, you must have seen all of this, went, oh, there's been nothing on. Nothing at all. And I was just stunned. How could the, you know, I just thought, well, how can the world press ignore this? That's happening like this. Because it was the first real, as far as I was aware, first real um, games where everybody was being treated as an athlete. We were being taken seriously now after the debacle of um, Paralympic, uh, Paralympic Games that had gone before, uh, where the media you know, just, you know, come here, I'll give you a hug, uh, a good boy, pat on the head, you know, well done you for competing. Um, isn't it wonderful, you know, to see people with, you know, this missing or that missing or with this disability or that disability able to even think about doing this kind of so condescending. So, uh, but it wasn't like that in Barcelona, uh, sorry, in, in uh, Seoul. It was really professional. Uh, and I thought, well, you know, they're filming all these races and even the heats were being filmed and yet there wasn't anything at all. Um, they would show, um, they would show various um, uh, various uh, races and um, or, but, or around track and field or um, judo and stuff like that back in the village so it would be live broadcast in the village and you know um, revisited in the evenings and stuff like that but outside of the village nothing nothing Where at all. what happened to that footage did they I don't know do you think there were countries that were Sorry. Yeah, yeah. I think there were countries that were streaming it. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, I, I've, I've never seen any footage from it. Yeah, you don't know what countries. No, not off, not off the top of my head. Um, I think even Amer even the Americans weren't streaming because um, I know if they had been, then Dennis would have had it. There was, yeah, there is some footage mm -hmm. of uh, the finals in Seoul. Which is on YouTube, mm. and you would find it if you if you um, search for Dennis Oler, O E H L E R. Um, it comes up with a lot of videos with him because he trained before the games with um, uh, some of the legends in um, American track athlete athletics, um, and so there was there's, there's footage of him with various celebrities and stuff like that wow. uh, on YouTube and uh, certainly the I think it was a bit of a medal ceremony something like that but 
the, the, the thing was that 100 meter final was one of the highlights and the stadium was you know, a lot of people in the stadium but once the race was over uh, because they took so long in, in checking you for drug abuse by the time we got out for the medal ceremony, it was empty. That's, that's really a bit, mm, bit of a letdown. But it's just, I mean, it was the same in the uh, in the World Championships this year. Denver. You know, but you know, by the time they dope tested them all, um, and they had a medal ceremony, it was like just the family in the in the stadium or something. Is like that, that why was it the dope testing? Yeah, it, yeah, it takes so long. They they drag you in straight after the race, first, second, third, drag you in test you, you know, and then you're left sitting around waiting for a test or waiting for the results of the test. But uh, then, you know, as I say, by the time they take you out for the medal ceremony, if you was at one of the last races or something like that, then there's going to be no, everybody's going to be gone by then. And the next games? Did you want to go in order? Yeah, so just where did you go from 88 and then, yeah, talking about um, in Barcelona? Yeah, in Barcelona, I think um, a lot of the sprinters, um, me in particular, I was starting to think, well, you know what, I'm going to get a bit long in the tooth for 100 and 200. Um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll still get into the finals, I think, but I don't think I'm going to medal really. So I need to look at, you know, what else maybe I can, I can do. And so I was always good at high jump. So, and that was part of the pentathlon. Uh, disc, my disc was okay. My long jump was good. Um, and 100 meters was obviously what I trained for. 400 always killed me. And it will always kill anybody who does it. <laughs> it is so hard work. Such hard work, 100, 400 meters. It's just a sprint. That's it. 400 meters. And you die. <laughs> oh, so we're having <coughs> to... Um, Fund yourself? Are you having to work all this time? Yeah, I was having to work. I was really lucky actually, because after I won medals in in Seoul, um, my company, the CEO of my company, uh, Morgan Stanley, he was a big sports fan and a big distance runner fan. So when they moved, um, I I started out by trying to get sponsorship internally um, with the head of operations and things like that in the bank. And um, fortunately for me, um, the bank were moving from the West End into Canary Wharf, mm -hmm. into all these brand new offices in Canary mm -hmm. Wharf, from three or four different offices in the West End, mm -hmm. where we had been. And so um, I thought, good idea if we ran from the West End into Canary Wharf to the new offices, mm -hmm. and we'd try and raise some funds doing that. And we got joined by the CEO. Mm -hmm. um, and so... Um, we made some funding from that, but then the CEO, um, then I went to New York for um, some trials uh, at the New York, uh, at the American Games. Um, again, it was all about who was going to go to Barcelona in, um, and to do as were the World Championships after that. But when, I, when we went to New York, my coach took real advantage of, of the whole thing because my CEO was moving back to New York and he said, you know, when you when you come out to New York, he said for the games because I told him about what was going on, um, and it was at university he went to in upstate New York, and so um, he came out to watch the, the games, and my coach and then he said, you know, do you want to invite some? I'm going to have a barbecue later. Do you want to invite some friends back? So, uh, to my me and two of the other uh, sprinters and my coach went out to his place in Long Island. And um, my coach um, said, you know, it's okay if we have a chat, um, you know, a little bit later. And he said, yeah, fine, no problem. So he took him aside and said, um, you know, <coughs> Robbie's in selection for, you know, Barcelona, um, but he's not going to make the squad unless he gets the time to train. Because we're talking about it's not just two disciplines now, it's, it's, it's five different disciplines. And he's going to need like a whole afternoon every day, yeah. maybe longer, to train for this. So he said, "Yeah, whatever you need." So they they paid me full time. Wow! Um, and twelve o'clock every day, I went off to Crystal Palace and trained. That's amazing. Yeah. So I was really, really lucky.
And of course, you know, with that kind of uh, with that kind of support, you're always going to make a squad for Barcelona. Um, obviously, you have to have the talent as well, but um, with that much training, yeah, yeah. And so, in the World Championships, um, leading up to those games, um, um, was the first time that um, we had got together with any of the world class athletes who were pentathletes. Some of them were good at really good at discus, um, but point scoring, you know, you can make it up if you're good at sprints or good at mm-hmm. long jump. So, I came fourth in the world championships, but I lost by. Um, four centimeters, I think it was. I lost a, I lost a bronze by four centimeters, something mm-hmm. like daft like that. Yeah. Um, just unlucky. Mm. But that was enough to get me into the squad okay. for Barcelona. Um, and because there was, there was a, um, there was a suggestion that in Barcelona they were going to do a four by one hundred meter sprint. Mm. At the end of the end of the games, or towards the end mm. of the games, um, I was another athlete who could who could join that squad. So, um, so I made the squad. Mm. Yeah, for Barcelona. From that, I was really lucky. Um, yeah, so what was that like? Barcelona, Barcelona was off the scale, really. Um, the, the amount of media attention was was awesome. It was the first time that we had had. You know, we were getting interviews with. Professional, um, you know, uh, professional interviews from Sky, Channel Four, all that kind of stuff. Um, and you actually—it's the first time you were actually made to feel like a professional athlete, um, like you were just playing at this, and that you they weren't being nicey nicey to you. It wasn't pat on the head stuff. It was all taken very very seriously. Uh, and of course, um, although there wasn't enough media. Uh, shown live here, um, it was uh, there was a lot of global stuff that went out live, etc. So it raised the profile of everything. Uh, those games raised the profile of the whole thing. And after that, I think after that, that those games were a turning point, certainly for the for the media. Um, it set a new new scale, new standards, uh, and everything else, because uh, a lot of the athletes were breaking world records, left, right, and centre, especially in the pool. You know. Um, and it was, they, the, I think the media saw it as this is quality now. Uh, this is something we can we can distribute and work on, and uh, there is an audience for this now. So uh, it was great, for Barcelona, for that. Um, that that alone, but it was a real experience, Barcelona. Um, <coughs> I don't know if you know this, but in. In um, in Paralympic Games and well, in, in even in World Games, things like that, when you have to when you have to um, have maybe four or five athletes in in one apartment uh, in Barcelona, they, they had apartments for six to eight athletes. So there were six of us in um, in Barcelona in in the um, in the apartment there. But they always what they always do as well is that they um, they try and they try and put you with if you're a solidomite, you've got no arms, then they'll put you with someone who's got a half leg missing or a leg missing or something like that, who's got a, a lower extremity disability. So they can help you, you know, carry a bag or, you know, move your stuff around, help you get dressed. Whatever you need really. So um, and so that's that's you know that that's great because it gives you a better insight into how difficult it can be for um, other athletes suffering from a different disability or trying to come to terms with coping with that disability in sport and how hard they have to work. And it's a great eye-opener. So I enjoyed it for all of those things. Um, yeah, it was great. Do you have any sort of standout memories? In Barcelona? Yeah, yeah but... Um, there, there were a lot. Of, there were a lot of memories of Barcelona. I mean, uh, there was a, a film crew there who um, who were doing their own thing, um, and they decided it would be a good idea to take myself and one of the other prime candidates for uh, a medal out on the town. 
so they they hired a car convertible ripped out ripped out the seats put the cameras in there uh, that's crazy that was a bit crazy you got that yeah 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 I've got I've got some of it there's a lot of it they wouldn't show me um, but yeah it was cool um, um, and because it it, uh, it was um, yeah, well the other bad thing was it was the first time that um, we had got another 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 warm up track which was a virtual stadium in its own right um, to, to warm up in before you were taken to the main stadium so the whole thing felt much more professional much more I uh, was much more focusing and um, it was a bit terrifying actually Barcelona in a lot of ways because when you went in, when you went out in the stadium you had no idea the, the, that there was 80,000 people going to be in the stadium and the roar you know of because uh, they the Catalonians just love sport of any kind so the stadium was packed the swimming pool was packed every night when it was sold out the whole thing was you know there were no seats left for any of the any of the stadiums it was great so first time in, in anything like that because in in most of the time as an athlete especially as a disabled athlete you know you're running into one man and his dog or in the stadium and that's about it a few of your, few of your friends or family and that's about it you weren't used to going into the stadium with 80,000 people going mental yeah so that was that was that was a standout moment was definitely at the end of 4 by 100 even though we had lost was putting on a Catalonian flag and just running around the stadium and you know to listen to the, the, the sound of the crowd just going mental because of that it was cool it was very cool do you think that's like the maybe the Olympics and Paralympics becoming more commercialised yeah yeah, I don't know about I don't know about commercialized, but I think it's easier now for um, for good athletes to get sponsorship from um, sports company like Adidas and various other. Um, am I allowed to say Adidas? <laughs> but, you know, like Adidas, etc. Um, they're more willing to they're more willing to um, give you their kit, etc. Um, so even even if it's just a kit, usually it's just the kit. Uh, they won't give you any funding, but they'll give you some some trainers and you know and spikes and track gear and things like that, wet gear, whatever. Usually, um, you know, I was fortunate enough to get sponsored by them um, in the lead up to um, Barcelona. You know, so I look forward to this hamper of like good track gear coming through the post. You know, cause usually I'd worn out everything by then. Yeah, in Barcelona, the pentathlon, which is 100, 400, long jump, discus, and shot. Did you get a medal? No, I was, I was in, in Barcelona, I was fifth, because I tore the hip flexor. Yeah. Uh, and I, I stayed with it in the stadium until we were coming up to the 4 by one and I thought, I'm really going to do some damage if I, if I, if I run the four, if I, sorry, if I, if I run the 400 meters, which was the final event. I will just leave the worst to the last, yeah. and I thought um, if I do it, then it's going to hurt. It's going to really hurt, and also you're not going to medal because you you're not going to gain enough points from the 400 meters to medal. So okay, so you could be fourth or fifth, fine. Um, but I looked at the points, and even though I, you know, even though I I decided not to do it, um, I, I knew I was still going to be fifth. So I didn't do it because of the four by one hundred. I knew we were the best and fastest team in the world. I knew we would medal in it, provided nothing stupid went wrong, uh, which unfortunately it did. But um, <laughs> and I knew that um, you know the only way was going to be to get a quarter zoned, um, to get the hip flexor quarter zone treatment on it, and rest on it, and save it for the four by one. So. That's what I did. I saved it for the four by one. You know, um, we had been we had been practicing the day before, in one of the warm up tracks, the changeover, 
because it has to be done really precisely because you're moving so fast mm. and you've got to gauge mm -hmm. precisely mm -hmm. when he hits the, the, the beginning of that change over mm -hmm. lane and you, it must be done within a certain distance. Mm -hmm. It's not a simple thing at all. It takes mm -hmm. a lot of practice. And um, the first two guys who were doing the f first and second leg, we, they were training with us on, on the track. But then they decided, uh, you know what, uh, we've got this down pat now. We're, we're going to go. I said, I said, I've been watching the last three or four changeovers that you've done, and they're rubbish. You need, you need to, to, to take this seriously. You need to put mm -hmm. in some more time on this. Mm -hmm. and they just went, nah. Nah, it'll be fine. Don't worry about it. It'll be fine. So, <laughs> yes. So, um, you know, I I stayed and we worked on um, we worked on the changeovers more because it was more crucial um, because changing a baton to someone who has no arms is is difficult in itself. Yeah. It has to be, but it has to be seriously precise. Um, you can't you can't mess it up. It's, you only get one go at it. Yeah. To put it in the right place, and within that short distance, yeah. going at full stretch, it's a difficult task. Did yeah. they keep that the same as the able-bodied athletes? Yeah. Wow. So you know we we um, because of the what happened in the first part of that that leg. Um, then we were slightly behind. I caught everybody up in in the third part of it on the bend because um, uh, bends are my strong point um, in 200 because um, you're, you're supposed to, in 200, you're supposed to shorten your gait. Mm -hmm. And it's a natural effect if you're a left leg below knee missing mm -hmm. because you're leaning into the bend and it's mm -hmm. a left bend. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you just tend to do it without even thinking about it. Mm -hmm. Or certainly I do. So well, I was always going to run one of the bend, whether it was first or second. Mm -hmm. um, but it was always going to be more difficult um, to do the second bend because of um, you know of of, um, of what you were facing in terms of disability. Mm -hmm. So giving it to the guy without any arms or shoulders, well, shoulders, but nothing from the shoulder down. It was always going to be a difficult task, but yeah, we got it done past. Right. Really clean yeah. changeovers in the end. Right. Yeah, it was really good. I still thought we had a medal, so I was elated at that point, but right. you know, disappointment. It went from elated to disappointed, angry, and then just going, well, it is what it is, you're not going to change it now, man. Right. So, and it's just going, picking up a Catalonian flag and running around the stadium with everybody. Getting, you know, standing on their feet, yelling, um, eighty thousand people in the stadium. It didn't get any better than that. No, no. You know? wow. So that was Incredible. pretty cool. And then a friend of mine, who was the, the England setter, the England ladies setter, fantastic volleyball player. Um, we all started hanging around with the, this group of volleyball players, and I got to know um, some of the major players. Uh, and in London, they decided that they wanted to bring back in. A disabled version of volleyball, uh, which I'd never even heard of before, which was sitting volleyball. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, sitting volleyball is not really a good name for it because although you sit on the floor, you have to move mm -hmm. really fast. Mm -hmm. I mean, faster than I've seen able bodied guys move across the court. You have to move around this court. Mm -hmm. um, so you need to be seriously fit and you need to have a serious court. Um, and uh, it's so fast. Able-bodied guys play it, and they just—they look useless. Mm. Um, they just can't cope with it. Mm. Um, but they will play it, and um, they'll play it because it—it's it, fast. It's the lower net, obviously, mm -hmm. because you're on the, on the floor. Um, but it's—it's it's your eyeball coordination improves so quickly, and when you go back to playing standing volleyball, it looks like everything's moving in slow motion almost. Really? Yeah, wow. it, it gives them a great perception yeah. of where the ball's going to go. Yeah. Uh, and their eyeball coordination and their, their awareness goes up yeah. so so much wow. uh, just from playing it. So they, get a, they gain a great deal. They may not think, uh, I know they're, they're, 
they're they're always complaining about their backsides hurting really badly and their thighs hurting because initially when you start doing it it's it hurts a lot yeah yeah Imagine. yeah it does hurt a lot so um, what was your involvement with that well I I again because of my contacts at Morgan Stanley um, <coughs> they wanted to revive the whole thing so um, I I uh, got together with um, uh, with the guys and uh, we decided that best place to promote a revival would be in London and how are we going to do that I don't know let's get a couple of the best teams from Europe um, to demo the whole thing and try and get a couple of the corporate banks involved so with my contact with Morgan Stanley I decided to, you know go and see the boss again say you know um, would you be interested in sponsoring this and yes. you know could you could we is it okay if we put a team together from with a Morgan Stanley name on it mm-hmm. and he said yeah do whatever you want yeah so they sponsored the whole thing got the teams all from Europe um, and um, started a revival in, in London I started uh, um, a club called East London Lynx which was uh, an off shoot from the London Lynx club which is run by Gary Beckford and he he, he knows um, everything about and everyone in volleyball and he's been involved in it his whole life the All Nations Tournament is is run by him I don't know if you've heard of the All Nations Tournament mm-hmm. it's you can you can enter a team as long as you're all from the same country mm-hmm. um, you can enter a team into this tournament that happens mm-hmm. over two weekends mm-hmm. in London um, so you you know, if you get together with a bunch of friends of you who are all from Japan, mm-hmm. you can enter a Japanese team or Taiwanese team, and it's become so popular. Yeah. They've had to stretch it now. It's going to go into it's probably going to go into three weekends um, next year because it's so it's such um, such high demand for places in it. It's going to run out of countries, I think, soon. So um, going back to the games and the kit. Mm. So we've seen uh, various items of, of the kit that you've got. I don't know if you can talk us through descriptions from your oh, well, you brought. <laughs> one of them is uh, one of them is uh, a weatherproof jacket from Barcelona. The other is part of um, the the, um, the track bottoms are part of uh, what was um, our travelling kit uh, out to out to Barcelona, uh, and um, that was there. There's the obviously the um, uh, the flex foot that Blatchford's put together, the headlined in the press uh, that I wore during the opening ceremony of the games for 2012. Um, Would you say that was heavier than? One? It is heavier than yeah, it is heavier than any other flex leg that I've ever had. Um, but that that leg is. Um, I mean, this is the thing. I mean, uh, flex feet are great for uh, for sprints and things like that, and are good for you know fast fast activities. But when you need more stability, then that that leg is quite you know well does quite as a really good job. Um, but there are, there are different legs for different things. For snowboarding, I have a different leg uh, completely um, that has more flexion around the ankle. Uh, whereas you know this flex that I've got is is a real split toe, and it's easy. The transition from heel to toe movement is the same as you would have if you were able-bodied. So you know it's a smooth transition. I wouldn't be able to do that in a flex foot because it's set up for you to sprint on. So you'd be on your toes all the time, and you know be like walking around with a ballerina or something crazy. Um, and again, diving legs are different. You know, you can you can adjust the ankle so when you put the fin on, it's in, a, in the right position, and um, it will fill with water. I so it will, yeah. yeah, because otherwise, even when you put it on, it's just going to pull you straight to the top. Yeah, you can't get can't get enough weight on to get down, so it has to have a hole in it which fills up internally, and maintains the same pressure as the water around, wow. which is really cool, mm, it's clever. Yeah, I know. Yeah, and when you get out of the water, it just it all pours out, mm. with a you know, like a big leaking fountain. Mm. So, yeah, um, yeah, we have we have uh, two of the bronze medals 
one for the 100, one for the 200 uh, from, from Seoul. Um, and um, there's, I've got the key, uh, what is, what the mayor says was the key mm -hmm. um, to the city, um, basically. Uh, and it's basically a picture, it's got a picture of the Seoul Gate on the front of it. It's very, very nice, it's heavier than the two medals actually. Um, and uh, I don't know how much bronze is in there, but it's heavy enough. But uh, yeah. You were telling us about the um, onesie, or all oh in one. <laughs> How were you? Yeah, just, onesies. Just, I mean, I'm curious about the, the fabric as well and how things might have changed. Yeah, I don't know how, how much things have changed from Barcelona to now. Mm. It doesn't look to me like anything has changed. No. You know, okay, so in swimming, you know, they've got, they've got suits that they win, uh, and the water has changed because, you know, they put special... Um, they put a special solution in the water to make it smoother to glide through, etc. Mm -hmm. So, um, on a the track, they're making the tracks faster, mm -hmm. bouncier, all that kind of stuff. So you get fast, slow tracks still. Mm -hmm. um, but for uh, for sprinting, the legs have obviously changed, mm -hmm. the spikes have obviously changed. Um, but that one-piece suit mm -hmm. doesn't look to me like there's a lot of change in that. No. I don't see. It. You know, I don't think. Uh, Changing that's going to make a lot of difference to the. Were, were able bodies um, athletes wearing suits like that? They were wearing exactly the same really? thing. Yeah. We got the same kit as they did. Okay. So exactly the same kit as they yeah. did. Um, which we were all quite shocked about. She didn't yeah. think they were going to give us that kit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, so that, that running outfit, mm. <laughs> so it's one piece. Mm -hmm. Onesie. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, I was going to call it a leotard. It is. It is really a leotard. I mean, um, not many, not many of the the guys wore anything underneath that. Really. Yeah, which is why there was, which is why probably the first four rows in Barcelona was filled with women and <laughs> and <laughs> and not men. <laughs> um, yeah, it didn't leave a great deal to the imagination. Though. Oh, really? Yeah, no. <laughs> no, not at all. Well, it left nothing to the imagination, <laughs> I have to say. <laughs> so, um, favourite memories, favourite stories? Yeah, I mean, favourite memories, obviously, um, you know, uh, Barcelona would be, you know, um, the relay. Oh, the relay. Yeah, even though it was, you know, we lost the relay, it was still... It was in a full stadium, yeah. Um, so, eighty thousand people in the stadium, or sixty thousand, the capacity was. It was packed to the rafters, and you know the crowd's response afterwards. You know, going on with the Catalonian flag. Um, I wasn't disappointed. You know, we weren't we weren't that angry with the guys. It's you know, it's what are you going to do? I mean. You, we weren't going to change anything, so um, we still remain friends. <laughs> <should I say? laughs> we still talk to each other. Um, but uh, yeah, that was my favourite moment, and obviously the opening and closing ceremonies in Barcelona were um, mind blowing. They were great, and so definitely, I thought so was going to change everything, and it did um, because it, it meant there was a more serious focus on Barcelona. Um, but I was really gutted that there was so much attention, media attention in Seoul. None of it appeared on mainstream UK television, which I just thought was a horrendous and appalling thing to happen. What was your first experience of the My Olympics? My first then? experience of the Olympics all yeah. goes back a long way um, to probably um, what, 1980, probably. Um, it was a long way for me because I never used to watch sport I was always involved in sport too much yeah. so um, but then you know I watched the I think it was the 19, um, 1980 games I think and that, uh, that got me interested but I watched it but didn't realise that there was an equivalent Paralympic Games um, but it did spark me to, well I say spark me it it gave me the impetus to want to do something, but I felt frustrated because I didn't know of anything I could do. So, um, 
and I knew that I didn't have the I didn't have the if you like uh, the equipment to to do any of those things. It was just legs that kept breaking. It was a bit a bit boring. But I thought, you know, oh, maybe I can do some shot puts, or maybe I can do discus because you don't need to you don't need to be running at full pelt to do any of those things. Not, it's not like long jump or javelin or something like that, pole vault. You know, at least I can still be involved in the sport in some form or another. Um, but it wasn't until flex fruit was available that, that changed the whole complexity of everything. For not just me, but for a lot of athletes worldwide. We've got access to it. Unfortunately, it took a while for everybody to get access to it. That's the only downside of it. A lot of people couldn't afford it in other countries. So. When was your first experience with the Paralympics? Or just awareness? Yeah, the, my, my first awareness was a very brutal um, uh, visual impact of seeing the report from the 1984, which I said before, it was such, it was a pat on the head, discon- it was so, uh, it was brutal to watch. It made you cringe, just watching this commentator talking to athletes you know and some of the things that were said afterwards was you would never hear anybody say that kind of thing now um, but then it was you know, uh, I just thought but then I, I saw it and thought well you know I can I can I can do that I can get involved in this somehow <laughs> you know and so I just went and found out more about it and I had to dig deep to find anything about disabled sport in this country. Mm-hmm. There was nothing in the media or anywhere. I had to really... And, um, you know, online, nothing. Well, there wasn't any online, really, at uh, time. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, it just had... It was kind of word of, word of mouth kind of thing. You know, you met someone... Um, met someone at... I actually met someone uh, at a... I think it was uh, at a club level. Um, Able body club level in Sittingbourne when we were doing it. My coach at the time, she said, oh, I've heard about this, this, and this. Um, and she said, it's run by this this woman. You should give her a call. And and um, I talked to this, this, this lady, and she was raving about um, disabled sport because her husband was um, had suffered from polio, and he was a weightlifter. And she was really keen to get me into weightlifting and bodybuilding or whatever, Weightlifting, sorry, um, and you know, I thought, no, no not for me. Um, but that's how I became involved with other disabled athletes, and through her, um, got to learn about. Yes, there were athletes trying to sprint, even with the rubbish that they give you, and there were athletes trying to do long jump with those legs as well. I thought, how can they? Get, you couldn't get up enough momentum to. You know, jump twelve inches. Never mind. You know, a few meters. Um, yeah, but like I say, the technology changed things. Yeah. Incredible. Mm. So, what would you say to any um, athlete now? Dig any deep. Future? <laughs> <laughs> Dig deep. That, I would say, if you if you are thinking about it, you have to be focused on it. It's going to take up all of your time.